Good evening, everybody. My name is Paolo Barlera. I'm the interim director of the Italian Cultural Institute. And it is my pleasure to welcome you tonight for a, what uh, promises to be a very interesting conversation. Uh, we begin tonight a series of uh, conversations um, that was um, uh, conceived and organized in collaboration with the uh, Consulate General of Italy. And uh, uh, the theme of this cycle is uh, sustainability. Um, and it's going to touch different uh, um, areas of sustainability. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, what Italy and Italian um, scholars scientists and, and researchers are doing about it. Um, uh, we're going to talk tonight about artificial intelligence and then we're going to talk about sustainability in economics, in the environment, in food and other topics. Um, so I hope you will continue following us. Uh, tonight we have um, with us Francesca Rossi who is an AI ethics global leader and a distinguished research staff member at IBM Research. And she is the author of uh, this book, Il Confine del Futuro. Um, possiamo fidarci dell'intelligenza artificiale? Can we trust artificial intelligence? Um, and uh, um, to talk to uh, in conversation with, with Francesca, we have the, uh, the soul and spirit of this cycle of conversations. Maria Teresa Cometto, a journalist and award-winning author based in New York, um, who has been covering business for many years, uh, business and high tech for Corriere della Sera, the leading Italian daily. And she also writes for other important magazines. Uh, so I want to uh, thank Maria Teresa for um, organizing this series of conversation and for being with us uh, tonight. Finally, the event is co-presented by Marchigiani in America, and I want to thank uh, Riccardo Latanzi for uh, uh, partnering with us for this event. And then maybe later we'll hear uh, from him. Uh, so uh, thank you again for joining us. and. Please, Maria Teresa, thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Shall I grab the mic? Or? Thank you, Paolo, uh, for asking me to do this uh, fourth uh, uh, series of conversations. I'm very happy to uh, keep working with the, the uh, Italian Cultural Institute in New York, and thanks also to the Consul, of course. Uh, thank you, Ricardo, who is a scientist uh, himself, uh, besides being the uh, founder and promoter of uh, Marchigiani in America. Uh, also, Francesca here is a proud uh, Marchigiana, right? You were born in Ancona, so can you tell us uh, uh, what, is, uh, what, what are you most proud of uh, uh, your region? Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for inviting me here. It's really a pleasure to be uh, here and uh, being able to discuss these themes with all of you. Uh, so what I'm uh, most proud about uh, Le Marche. Okay. Le Marche is the only region that has a plural name, <laughs> which, means, uh, which means that we are very diverse and uh, we have a lot of different um, you know, features, a lot of different capabilities. Uh, we have uh, the mountains, we have the sea, we have the hills. Uh, so there, you really find a lot of different people in this region. And that, I think, is the, the strength of this very small, but I think very influential region of Italy. So every time I can, you know, I try to go back. My parents are still there. And, um, and I love, you know, going around and discovering even more. There are still places that I have discovered of the region. Um, you were born in Ancona, but you went to study um, uh, at the University of Pisa. Mm -hmm. uh, 
um, and you study compu computer science and you start getting uh, interested in artificial intelligence, uh, what um, inspired you uh, to, to choose that field? Well, first of all, I went to Pisa because uh, I'm old enough uh, that when I started, uh, you know, when I went to the university, there were very few places in Italy that had the computer science curriculum. And the first one was Pisa. So the first place in Italy where there was a computer science curriculum. So, and then I decided to go there for a series of coincidences, but anyway, so it was one of the places. And I think I was um, interested in computer science because I felt that it was a very new thing at the time. I felt that I could, uh, mm, uh, I could build or learn about uh, the future, you know. Uh, so that was what was inspiring me. Then I did all my, you know, studies and my exams. And then when it was the time to choose uh, the topic of my thesis, la laurea of laurea. Um, then I had some several options, and I think that, uh, um, well, I chose this topic, artificial intelligence, already for my laurea thesis, uh, because I felt uh, it was um, a topic that, yes, it was part of computer science, but also something that had to do with, uh, um, with humanities as well. So it was uh, more uh, multidisciplinary than just uh, a, com a typical computer science uh, approach. But then, of course, other, other things influenced me to choose that, like, for example, the professor that I was going to work with and so on. But I think I felt that it was multidisciplinary more than other things uh, that were just technical. Uh, and to this day, I think that what really love about AI is a very, you know, it touches upon many aspects of our life. Uh Talking about what is artificial intelligence, uh, Francesca is uh, one of the best experts uh, in the world about artificial intelligence, uh, and uh, uh, she's also able to explain uh, in a very sim simple way. Uh, if you uh, are able to read her book, uh, it's, uh, it's very uh, readable and very uh, approachable. So can you tell us uh, in a simple way what is artificial intelligence? So artificial intelligence is a technology and a scientific discipline that has the goal to build machines, which can be software or software and hardware or combined, eh, that um, can solve problems in ways that uh, would require intelligence if they were solved by human beings. So that's the goal of the scientific discipline. Then how researchers in this scientific discipline have tried to reach that goal and are still working because the goal has not been reached yet, of course. Um, they, over the years, because artificial intelligence uh, is in every newspaper today, but, and, and in the last few years, but actually it started uh, long ago, more than 60 years ago, the first time that this uh, term, artificial intelligence, was used was in 1956, so it has been a long By time. By whom? By John McCarthy, in a, um, he uh, organized a summer uh, workshop at the Dartmouth College, uh, where he put together several mathematicians, because computer science was not existing at the time, so there were no computer scientists, mathematicians that decided to meet and in the summer to solve the artificial intelligence, uh, whatever, goal, to reach, to be able to build machines that were as intelligent as human beings. So they were very optimistic, because we still haven't reached that goal. But over these uh, decades, people, meaning researchers, have tried to reach that goal following uh, two main uh, parallel uh, lines of work. The first one, which are very obvious if you think about it, the first one is uh, um, for problems that are very uh, clear and uh, for which we human beings know exactly how to define the steps to solve the problem. So we think about the problem, we try to understand what are the steps one after the other one to solve the problem, and then we write this algorithm, we call it this step-by-step -step recipe in some sense to solve the problem. We code it into a machine, and then from now on, the machine knows how to solve the problem. But we told the machines how to solve the problem. Uh, and that was the kind of artificial intelligence that we used for many, many decades until 
uh, um, but there was also another line of uh, pos possible option to tell to build intelligent machines, and the other line that was kind of dormant for a lot of uh, decades. The other line it says, okay, if I if I cannot figure out how to solve a problem by knowing exactly all the steps to do to solve the problem, what can I do? Even with another person, what do I do? If I cannot tell you exactly all the steps to solve a problem, I just give you a lot of examples. You say this is a problem, this is a specific instance of the problem, and this is the solution. This is another problem, and this is the solution. I give you millions of these to a machine, and then I just code into the machine a very simple algorithm that allows the machine to generalize from these examples so that the machine can solve problems even when the, the instance of the problem is not one of the examples that I gave. So this is the machine learning approach that is so successful right now. But for many years, it could not, it was not successful because in order to make it successful, you need a lot of examples. And until the 80s and even later, we didn't have data. We didn't have a lot of examples and we didn't even have computers that were fast enough, powerful enough to deal with all these examples. So now we do have them and that's why the machine learning approach is so useful and so successful in many applications, especially in those applications that we do not know exactly how, what are the steps to solve the problem. Um, yeah, talking about applications, can you give us uh, some exa practical examples uh, of applications of artificial intelligence uh, that have already an impact, positive, uh, I hope, on our daily life? Well, I have trouble thinking about an activity that we do in our life that, that is not supported by artificial intelligence. So I'll give you an example of uh, something that follows the first kind of AI techniques that I told you. For example, the GPS navigator that we have, I mean, Google Maps or whatever you use in your car and so on. So that's an algorithm that knows how to find the best path from where you are to where you want to go given possibly millions or a huge number of paths between these two points on the map. So given the maps, given where you are, given where you want to go, there is a very uh, basic AI algorithm that a researcher, so a human being, came up with already many years ago, and the machine just implements and follows that algorithm. And if, you follow the machine, if the machine follows that algorithm, it's sure to find in a very short time this best path, optimal path between these two places. So that's an example of using the kind of old fashioned kind of uh, uh, logical based AI. While machine learning uh, uh, techniques are used in, in many, many activities of our life, wherever uh, there are, uh, for example, we use a credit card, uh, and maybe th there is an algorithm, usually right now based on machine learning, that can uh, understand or try to predict whether that transaction that you want to do is a fraud or not. Uh, or, uh, uh, every time, I don't know, we take a picture with our camera, with our telephone, you see that there is, uh, uh, when you take a picture of a person, of a face, there is this green uh, box because there is an algorithm of mach uh, machine learning that uh, understands that that's uh, the image of a person. Uh, or in general, this, the, the dealing with spam in your uh, emails, that's based on uh, AI. Oh, but even all the apps that we use, all the social platforms that we use, the Facebook is an AI company, is only based on AI to interpret correctly your likes, your posts, uh, your pictures, your text, so that, uh, I mean, to, to achieve the business model, which is to give you the ads that are more suitable for you. Uh, talking about Facebook, uh, one uh, of the speakers at the uh, international conference about uh, um, artificial intelligence that was here in New York uh, last month, uh, and Francesca was the chairperson of the conference. So one of the speakers was the chief scientist of Facebook, uh, who won uh, one of the winners of the Turing uh, 
uh, award that is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for computer science. And he teaches at NYU, right? Mm -hmm. And so he and the other two, uh, you call them godfathers of artificial intelligence, they said they, they think they will be able to make uh, uh, machines uh, more and more intelligent, uh, even uh, able to use kind of common sense like us humans. What, what does it mean? What? Well, right now, um, uh, machines, I mean, in artificial intelligence uh, uh, techniques are very, again, they, they have a lot of applications and they're very successful in very narrow domains. You know, you give them a problem and they're very good at solving that specific problem but they're not very good at moving from one problem to another one, even if the, the, these two problems are very similar. So in some sense, they're very successful, but they're also very primitive in the way they learn, they generalize. And the reason why they're so primitive and they're so brittle, so they don't move uh, easily between one problem and another one, is because they, they still don't have this common sense reasoning, which is so much uh, um, um, intrinsic in everything we do. So when, uh, uh, you know, uh, when we interact between two human beings, we don't need to tell each other exactly all the things. You know, we know how the world functions. We know the bas basic notion of physics, even if we are not experts. Uh, we know that if I take this uh, microphone and I, and I open my hand, we know that it goes down. But I'm not an expert in physics, and even a four-year-old knows that. So uh, machines do not have this idea of how the world functions. And without that, they are uh, bound to be very successful only in very narrow domains. Uh, so they are not very robust. They cannot really go like we do, easily from one problem to another one. No? So for example, when we learn, uh, when we are a kid, we learn uh, what a horse is, you know, maybe it takes a lot of examples of, from our parents to tell us, and now then we understand what a horse is. But then once we know how, what's a horse, and uh, we know to recognize a horse, even if it's, it's in many different uh, you know, scenarios and many different positions. But then if the, our parents tell you, okay, so now I'll tell you that a zebra is like a horse, but with stripes. We don't need any example to know, now we know what a zebra is. So for, uh, for AI algorithms, that's not, still not possible. So they learn very well specific things, so they learn to recognize horses, but once you want them to learn how to recognize zebras, you have to start from scratch, because they fail to learn general concepts about you know, what, what the horse really is, and so they can then reuse those concepts to learn something a bit different. So in some sense, they are very primitive, even though they are so successful in many applications. Yeah. Uh, at, uh, at that conference, uh, a, a very interesting uh, guest was also uh, chess master uh, Kasparov. Yeah. And uh, he said that he was uh, uh, the very first victim of uh, uh, machines, intelligent machines, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yes. because he was about to lose his job. Uh, chess master, he <laughs> lost against uh, an IBM computer in uh, 1907, I think? 97. 97, yeah. Um, so, uh, actually, um, games are very important yes. in the history of development yeah. of artificial intelligence. Why? Yes, over the decades, many teams, many research groups have used games to advance AI and to test whether AI was be able to uh, was able to behave better than a human being or not because games of course you have this notion somebody wins somebody loses so you can compare a machine with a human being and also in many games the rules are uh, very clear you know and it's a closed world with very clear rules like for example chess you know how many pieces, you know how big the, uh, the chessboard is, you know, you, know, you know all the rules. Um, and so, for example, chess was used in, uh, and, uh, to, to test whether uh, the machine was going to uh, be able to beat uh, the best uh, chess player, human being chess player. So in 1997, this uh, program by IBM called the Deep Blue, Deep Blue, uh, won against Kasparov, and he did not like that. 
Not because it was the first time that he lost to a machine, but because for Gasparov in 1987, it was the first time for him that he lost, period. Okay? So, so for him, it was a shock. And in fact, even a few years ago, he wrote a paper, he wrote a book uh, telling the story where he, he really did not like that. Okay? But then, in fact, uh, he, he, he did not speak to IBM people for, for many years. Uh, and, uh, and at this conference, like a few weeks ago, he was in the same uh, panel, in the same discussion as uh, also the IBM person who was in charge of that team of, the, of uh, developing Deep Blue. And that was the first time for them to be in the same room after 1997. They made peace? Okay. Yes, I think so. But the IBM guy was a bit uh, worried about what's going on because Kasparov is very, uh, you know, can be very passionate to the limit of you know, kind of being very, you know, aggressive, aggressive but not, not aggressive, I mean. Uh, so, but Gasparov is a very good uh, story because it shows that, yes, uh, two things. One, that uh, games have been used many times. Chess is one example, but then IBM also used uh, Jeopardy, which is uh, like a, you know, a, uh, which is much more complex than chess. And then also other, other teams in other companies used other games like Go, uh, Solgi, or even uh, some uh, very simple video games, uh, so on. So, but anyway, the idea of using games is because rules are simple, which uh, makes it easy to advance AI so much that at some point you win a human being. But of course, uh, it's, uh, it can be misleading um, because, first of all, it makes people think that AI is in competition with human beings, while it's, and Kasparov said that as well uh, during that uh, discussion, while uh, overall people understand now that uh, the, the, the goal of uh, building intelligent machines is not to compete with us, but to be complementary with us and to augment our own intelligence. We have uh, uh, capabilities that machines don't have and vice versa. So, we should be supported by machines to do better whatever we want to do, to bet whatever decisions we want to make. Uh, of course, we are not capable uh, to analyze huge amounts of data and discover patterns in this data that can help us make decisions. That's something that where the machines can help. There are many other things where machines are not as good as us, it's like intuition, creativity, and uh, so on. So the idea of AI is not to compete like in a game, but to be complementary and to augment a human. And I think that uh, Kasparov understood very soon after this um, defeat, because he even started the tournaments of uh, human plus machine uh, chess players, okay? To understand really that what, what could be done by humans pl plus machines together, rather than uh, competing. And the second thing that, uh, lear uh, that uh, you learn when you think about using games to advance AI, you learn that the game, no matter how complex the game is, is always much, much simpler than real life. So then if you take uh, all the advancement that you built in a game and you try and you think that then it's easy to, um, to adapt it to some real life problem with this open world where the rules are not easy, where it can be uncertainty, you have to be flexible and so on, then it's not an easy path. And this is, for example, what happened when uh, the IBM had uh, built this Watson that won easily a Jeopardy against the best champions. Uh, but then one thing is to win a Jeopardy, one thing is to take the capabilities of Watson and to build uh, something that can help in healthcare, in financial systems, and so on. So it's not that obvious because real life is much more complex than a game. Yeah, talking about Watson, uh, the uh, I, uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, system built by IBM, one of the first applications, if I well remember, was exactly in uh, healthcare. So one very hot topic uh, uh, everywhere in the world, uh, Italy, now America included, uh, is uh, coronavirus. So how can artificial intelligence uh, help uh, uh, fight uh, diseases like coronavirus? Well, I mean, I'm not, I, I, I don't know in that specific disease or specifically for viruses, uh, but definitely AI can help in uh, uh, making sense, although this is something that 
should be used for human beings, not for machines, but anyway, just informally to understand what, what I mean, in making sense of huge amounts of data. Uh, and that can help predict the trend. Uh, we have seen already AI being applied to predict the trend of the spread of the virus um, and many other goals to reach possibly a solution. Uh, but in general, AI in healthcare can be used in many different uh, uh, parts of health, the healthcare uh, domain. Um, so, for example, one uh, area uh, where uh, Watson has been uh, and is still being applied is in in uh, uh, in cancer detection. Uh, for example, uh, using image interpretation, or in all those cases where you use images and doctors or radiologists or, uh, or oncologists need to understand uh, and interpret correctly a, um, an image, uh, like an X-ray you know, image or any other kind of image. So that's something that the machines can help us a lot. But even said that, uh, is it true that in some specific tasks, machines, even in healthcare, can be better than uh, doctors? But also in this uh, healthcare domain, usually the best results are when you put together the doctor and a machine. So there was a study like a few years ago about uh, the detection of breast cancers in patients that showed that uh, the same task, so the detection of breast cancer from some images of patients, was given to uh, the best uh, um, um, AI system at the time, a few years ago, uh, and the best oncologist. And they saw, and they saw that uh, the best oncologist had the, an error rate of 3.5%. So three or, or four times out of 100 they were making a mistake. The best AI system had an error rate of 7.5%. So still not as good as a doctor, uh, but then they asked the doctors to use the machines to uh, make better decisions, and when they put them together, the error rate went down to 0.5%. Wow, impressive. Yeah. Good, That's, there is hope. <laughs> um, well, uh, uh, you, Francesca, you uh, uh, taught uh, at universities uh, uh, for many years, uh, first at the University of Pisa, then uh, University of Padua. Um, and in 2014, I believe, you came to America for a sabbatical, um, and you were in this uh, um, Radcliffe Institute of Harvard, um, uh, discussing about uh, artificial intelligence with many other people in different, from different uh, uh, disciplines. And you collaborated also to the Future of Life Institute, where you met uh, among other people, Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla. And uh, one of your uh, research projects was funded by uh, Elon Musk, so you know him very well. And uh, this, that same year, 2014, uh, he tweeted that uh, artificial intelligence could be, quote, more dangerous than nukes. And he said also that artificial intelligence is, uh, uh, quote, our biggest existential threat, unquote. If he is so scared, why shouldn't we be scared? Well, first of all, because he's not an AI expert. <laughs> so, he, yeah, okay, so I would take with some grain of salt, you know, what people that are very successful in many, in many aspects, but are not AI experts, can tell you about AI. Okay. But second, um, also is not a really a very nuanced speaker. Usually, usually, you know, uh, uh, for what I for what I've seen, you know, by uh, talking with him, so he likes to do these things that immediately the media picks up as a quote, you know, because it's you know something like that immediately, you know, big title and so on. But uh, I think that you know the fact that he. Um, he funded this research program that was uh, handled by the Future of Life Institute that, that uh, funded about more than 30 projects, uh, showed actually the, that he was, a, um, he was concerned, but in a very constructive way. So he said, okay, I want to fund uh, research projects that are very uh, scientific and very solid science to understand how to um, uh, how to make it is in these machines not only smarter and smarter, but also um, 
following our own values. How do we make sure, in, in particular, my, my project was to try to understand how to embed uh, values like fairness or other values that we may care about into these uh, decision support systems uh, that a machine can where a machine can help uh, doctors or others to make better decisions so uh, so the interaction with him and with the future of life institute is of people that are concerned about the fact that uh, we have to in parallel improve the capabilities of AI, but at the same time also improve their uh, ability to follow up, to be aligned with our own values. Uh, because if you just improve the capabilities without doing also the other thing, then we may, uh, we may build machines that go in, in a direction that we don't want to go, that make decisions, for example, that make discrimination, so they're not fair. So, just to mention one value that is very important, and then many people are trying to understand how to embed into machines, um, so that whenever they make decisions, or whenever they recommend decisions to be made by a human being, they have in mind that this decision-making process, as to be fair, does not have to create discriminations. Yeah, talking about uh, decisions and also again about Elon Musk, he's not an expert in uh, artificial intelligence. However, his Tesla uses a lot of artificial intelligence uh, in order to make uh, uh, autonomous cars. Um, and uh, autonomous cars, uh, uh, some days it looks like they are already there, but actually I, uh, I understand that uh, we are still very far away. Uh, from a real uh, autonomous car. And uh, talking about decisions, uh, you are an expert in ethics. So, for example, uh, what do you teach an uh, autonomous car about uh, how to avoid uh, an accident if, uh, for example, there is a kid uh, crossing uh, uh, suddenly the street and the car has to decide whether to uh, <laughs> go uh, uh, on him, uh, crash him, or to deviate and crash an old person uh, on uh, the sidewalk. What do you teach that machine? Uh, okay, so uh, first, the reason why self-driving cars are still uh, not in our streets is because the same reason that we mentioned before about common sense reasoning. So self-driving cars, in general, AI systems, again, I said, you know, they do not have this capability to reason uh, common sense. And this uh, makes these uh, machines, including self-driving cars, uh, not robust. For example, they did an experiment very recently with the Tesla car, where they took a, um, a 35 uh, sp uh, miles speed limit, so it's a sign with 35, and they just, uh, uh, to where there was the tree, they just added a few inches of uh, uh, black tape to the place, uh, the middle of the tree, okay? So the, 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 this part of the tree was sticking out a little bit more. So much that the machine interpreted as an eight, okay? So the machine started to, the car started to speed up because it thought it was an 85, uh, an 85 uh, miles speed limit. But of course, even if they put this, uh, even if they write an, almost an eight, we understand that it cannot be an 85 uh, miles per hour. Maybe because in Germany? They, no, I think there is one place only in Texas, in the United States, that has uh, that, that uh, speed limit, but nowhere else. So the machine does, but the machine doesn't understand. The machine says, okay, let me interpret that picture. I interpret it as an 85, so I just speed up to 85. So you see that the, without an understanding of the context, of the fact that it's very improbable that is an 85, because we know that usually you, you don't find an 85 uh, uh, miles uh, um, per hour speed limit, then the machine is very uh, brittle, it's not robust. No? Uh, so it maybe makes very few mistakes in interpreting uh, an image, but it does not have this general contextual understanding of what is interpreting so that the interpretation can be more correct uh, than what, uh, what it does. So that's, that's, again, the common sense reasoning problem is you know, evident also in the self-driving cars. And of course, with machines and cars that make those mistakes, it's still not, uh, not safe to release them even though you can do a lot of tests, a lot of miles, and so on. Um, 
Uh, but what was the, other, the second part of the question Out about the uh, ah, autoboid? Yes, choose okay. uh, whether to crush yeah, a kid sure. or a so, uh, so that is an example that shows that uh, um, decision on what, how to code an AI system, whether it's a self-driving car or something else, cannot be done unilaterally by AI people. It has to be done in a very multidisciplinary and multi-stakeholder environment. That's a typical decision that the whole society needs to, to, needs to make. So it's not that some AI researcher or an engineer can decide this, uh, how to resolve that dilemma or any other one. Uh, it has to be something that all together we decide. Um, and so that shows really that uh, the only approach to make machine not only smarter, but also more aligned to our values is multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder, and possibly also multicultural, because of course AI can be deployed everywhere, you know, even if laws are different in different uh, regions of the world, but uh, it has to be you know, by comparing uh, um, among different cultures as well. Yeah, um, one of the concerns that we all have is about jobs. Uh, even we journalists can be replaced by robots today. Um, the Reuters, no, the Associated Press uses uh, already uh, robot journalists, uh, machines, uh, to write automatically um, uh, articles about financial uh, records of uh, companies. And the Los Angeles Times, I think, uh, they use uh, uh, robots uh, to write uh, immediately articles about an earthquake. Uh, um, uh, based on data from uh, uh, the geological, the U.S. Geological Survey. So, what about our jobs? Well, it's also about our jobs because you may have seen you may have seen that uh, during this um, AI conference of uh, two or three weeks ago in New York, there was also an invited talk by the president of the AI Association, the Worldwide AI Association, and she gave a talk about. Um, using AI to make scientific discoveries, okay? But, so even my job, science. you know, science. And, and there is also another very famous uh, AI researcher from Japan who posed this challenge of uh, um, um, using AI to make a, a big enough, important enough scientific discovery that the Nobel uh, Committee will give the Nobel Prize to an AI instead of a person. So there are people, that, I mean, it is understood that AI as techniques can help making scientific discoveries, but, uh, and also in many other jobs. But I think that both in the scientific discovery and in journalism and in other jobs like doctors, radiologists and so on, um, uh, what, what we have seen in some studies is that uh, each job con includes many different tasks. And some of these tasks maybe will be completely automated, but most of the other tasks will not, and uh, however, will require a deep cooperation between the human being and the machine. So this doesn't mean that it's going to be easy also for the tasks that are not automated, because the human being will have to learn how to work together with these machines. We we'll have to learn how to interpret correctly this output that the machine is giving. Uh, a typical example is uh, judges, no? Judges in the, in the US judicial system, AI has been used in the past to help judges evaluate the probability of recidivism, okay? Uh, and it was used in a way that, uh, in a way that was, uh, the judges were not really uh, trained enough uh, to understand what the machine, how the machine was, what the machine was doing, what the machine was telling them, and how to interpret that. As a result, that was shown um, several years ago already, uh, some of these uh, algorithms uh, suggested decisions to the judges that were shown to make discriminations between different groups of people. Um, and the reason was that uh, these machines were trained on historical data that were showing discrimination, uh, and that the judges that didn't know anything about the technology were just uh, believing, said, oh, if the, algorithm, if the computer tells me, it must be correct. So that's what I'm doing. So you need really to learn as a human being in every profession to work 
with the, the information that these machines will give. So some tasks will be automated, some tasks will not, but we will need to work together with the machines. And some jobs will be created. New jobs. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, a century ago, 90% of the population in the US was uh, farmers, were farmers, okay? Uh, after 100 years, now only 2% of the population. Uh, but, and of course, nobody could imagine all the jobs. I mean, it's not that 2% and then what about the other 88% are not without jobs, of course, because also because we have the lowest unemployment rate uh, today. But uh, of course, all these jobs were created also because of the new technologies. And of course, it's very difficult to envision these new jobs uh, very much in advance. Yeah. Um, mm, the ethical problems that you deal with uh, uh, were, uh, are at the center of the paper Rome Call for Artificial Intelligence uh, Ethics. Uh, you contributed uh, to that paper. Uh, what it is about? Uh, how, wh why is it important? So that many, many institutions over the past few years, uh, they uh, wrote principles for um, the, the responsible way to develop AI, to deploy AI, and to use AI. So there are really many, many sets of principles, um, and they all overlap a little bit with each other. Uh, so that you want the machines to be transparent, to be explainable, to be fair. Uh, you want the data that you provide to the machines to, uh, to be uh, clear how this data is going to be handled, and so on. So many, many different properties to make machines, usually the term that is called to make machines trustworthy and human-centric. You know, the idea is that you want these machines to be very smart, but always remember that we are in charge and they should help us rather than uh, go on their own way. So the Vatican, and in, in particular, to be precise, the Pontifical Academy of Life, which is the kind of a academy of the Vatican, they wanted to be part of this discussion. And they wanted to, uh, to write their own principles that they think uh, for a responsible development and use of artificial intelligence with specific that has a lot of overlapping with many other sets of principles that uh, other institutions have, have uh, written, but it has specific uh, uh, focus on things that Vatic the Vatican cares about a lot, like for example that uh, no one should be left behind, that there is a special care to people that are most uh, vulnerable, um, uh, and uh, that uh, again uh, this uh, technology should uh, think about the human family and the environment where we live. So all these values that are a, a bit specific uh, to the uh, to what the Vatican cares about. So they wanted to write this, uh, they call it the call for AI ethics, meaning they want uh, uh, to ask everybody, all the actors, all the stakeholders around AI to join and endorse uh, these uh, principles and to um, commit to producing or using or developing the technology in a way that respects those principles. So that's what they did. They, they uh, asked also uh, as a start, uh, the, the, this was released uh, last Friday, so they asked as a start uh, two big uh, companies, uh, uh, tech companies, Microsoft and IBM, to sign this um, call for AI ethics, uh, so that was, was done, uh, and, uh, and then hopefully many others will, will join. Great. Uh, let's uh, stay for a while uh, in Italy. Uh, University of Pisa is one of the best uh, research centers uh, uh, in Italy about computer science. Um, so uh, what, what can you tell us about the preparation you got for your career from Pisa, uh, which I believe was pretty good. But on the other hand, uh, what about the criticism that our research centers are too academics and not uh, really linked to industry? And uh, that's one of the reasons why we don't have a, an Italian Google, for example, even though we have great scientists and mathematicians. I think it's a series of uh, factors, not just one. Um, in Europe, uh, I think, not just in Italy, but in Europe, universities are more um, theoretically oriented, I would say. Or at least um, uh, what I know of uh, universities in Europe. Um, they, 
they uh, so they see science as advancing the knowledge not necessarily with an immediate uh, you know application or or not necessarily uh, being linked to something that uh, a company can take and then uh, do something with it um, which is also a kind of research that is needed definitely something that is completely driven by scientific curiosity is also needed if you want to have some long term vision um, um, and you don't you don't necessarily have to be incremental or very tied to short-term applications, so that's very good. But I, I always saw these European universities as being more inclined to that kind of research uh, rather than, you know... But then it's also true that the companies in Italy and I don't know the rest of Europe, but probably are less inclined, maybe because of the same reason as that I said before, to work with universities or to give a lot of funding to universities. Maybe because they see that again they have more short-term needs than what the university can provide. But but there are a lot of collaborations. Uh, the reason why there is no Italian or even European Google. I, I mean, I don't think there is one uh, cause. I mean, it's a, uh, of course, investments are very important. Um, uh, even private investments that are, of course, very different in, in Italy and in Europe compared to the US. Um, and, um, but still, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, uh, basic preparation around uh, computer science, for example, that I got from the University of Pisa is very, is, is, was very, and is to, even nowadays of the students, is very deep, is very, so when our students, once they finish our university, they go somewhere else, they, they are very successful, you know. And the reason is that, uh, for example, when you, uh, it's, it, the system uh, of study is completely different from uh, what it is here. So here it's more horizontal, multidisciplinary. You study computer science, what does it mean? It means that computer science is a major, but you also have other minors. You have many other courses on other disciplines that maybe don't have anything to do with the computer science, which is not, of course, a waste of time. It, it opens your, your mind and it allows you to understand if computer science can be used here or there or in, things that, in fields that are completely unrelated maybe to computer science, but you start to see the relationship during your studies as well. In Italy, when you study computer science, you study only computer science, okay? And maybe you have uh, like a very short course that you can choose that is, can be whatever you want, uh, but otherwise you study only computer science. So at the end of the studies, you have much more knowledge and much more deep knowledge about computer science than somebody else, but you are lacking this uh, um, uh, interdisciplinarity uh, of your understanding of the world. So in some sense, we are more like a narrow AI system than, uh, you know, this uh, multidisciplinarity. And more and more, I think that multidisciplinarity is needed in AI, for example. So, um, so this uh, very deep but narrow way of studying, I hope that also in Italy is complemented by some more uh, opening to other disciplines as well. Um, yeah, talking finally more specifically about uh, sustainability. Uh, you are involved in the initiative AI for Good that was founded uh, to discuss how artificial intelligence can help reach the 17 sustainable development goals defined by the United States uh, nation. Uh, what have you achieved so far? Okay, so that's initiative, it's interesting because it's really different from many other initiatives. So many initiatives that are interested in AI ethics, so in uh, embedding values into AI systems, are initiatives that say, this is the current state of AI, uh, and uh, I want to advance its capabilities, but at the same time, I want to make sure that the right values are into the AI system. So it's more like, this is where we are, let's try to go forward in a responsible way, okay? Uh, but they, uh, so it's an incremental way. Uh, and then in some sense they say, okay, let's try to move forward in a responsible way and then we'll see 
or, or we, in the future we'll see where we want to go. While this other initiative, AI for Good, is very different because it says, okay, this is where we are, this is the technology right now, and this is where I want to be. Uh, this is my vision of the future. And the vision of the future is a future where the 17 sustainable development goals of the UN are achieved. Okay? And now, I, let's try to understand how I go from here to that vision of the world. So, they, uh, uh, they put together, the, they call them the problem solvers, so the AI people that have the techniques and they advance the techniques to solve problems, with the problem owners, which are the UN agencies. UNESCO, UNICEF, and so on. So they know what the problems are in order to achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And then that initiative, which is, a, uh, in, is an event that happens every, I hope this year it will happen, every year in, uh, in um, uh, Geneva, you know, um, that puts together AI people on one side and UN agencies on the other side. And that's an event that over time, and I think it happened already for three years, over time you went from 300 to 1,000 to 3,000 people. So really a lot of success in identifying specific problems that are brought up by UNESCO, by the various UN agencies, and then AI people say, okay, you have this problem, I think I have the right technique, or I understand what I need to uh, advance in AI in order to solve that problem. So, but the, the peculiarity of that uh, initiative is really that it starts from the current technology and from a vision of the future. And then it says, how do I make sure that AI is, is improved to get to that vision of the future? Not is improved and then we'll see where we go. So. Yeah, I have many more questions, but I want to uh, up open the discussion because I know that a lot of friends are here uh, are very interested in artificial intelligence, and I'm sure they have a lot of questions. So, uh, who wants to start? And please uh, talk in the, in the mic because uh, uh, we are recording uh, this session, right? Yes. Thank you. So, first question. Good evening. My name is Arturo Zampaglione. I, I just wanted to ask you to expand quickly on the geopolitics of AI as you see it. Uh, who's winning the war? Who's losing it? Where are we as, for example, Italy or Europe? So, first of all, I usually don't use this um, narrative about winning and losing. Okay? Because <laughs> Probably, yes. Because that's the reason. No, because um, I think that they are, I am more for a collaborative uh, approach rather than uh, who wins and who loses. But it is true that in various regions of the world there are various approaches to AI and uh, also to uh, policies around AI and also to possible regulations around AI. So uh, historically, of course, the US is more bottom-up, lets innovative people try try whatever they want to try, and then if we see problem, let's see you know, what we can do about the problem. Um, China is very top-down, you know? this is what the government decides, how AI should be used, and everybody has to use AI in that way. Okay? And uh, in the Europe is uh, the middle ground, is uh, the place, so I'm also involved with the European uh, Commission, the European Commission put together a group, uh, is called the, the High-Level Expert Group on AI, that is a group, independent group, but that uh, advises the European Commission about uh, um, <clears throat> AI and AI ethics. So the group delivered already two documents. So one is uh, the uh, European uh, guidelines for a a AI ethics in Europe. And the second one is the recommendations for the European Commission for policies and investment for trustworthy AI in Europe. So the idea is uh, uh, that Europe, according to these guidelines, which by the way, were more or less followed in the recent white paper on regulating AI that the European Commission uh, uh, published uh, a few weeks ago, even. Um, that, that the idea is that uh, uh, Europe can be the place where uh, there is this uh, um, 
combination of a top-down and a bottom-up approach, meaning that, okay, we want to uh, innovate, uh, but we want to innovate not at the expenses of some fundamental rights that we think are uh, um, absolutely necessary. Okay, so uh, for example, this group uh, decided to start from the European Charter of Fundamental Rights that states these are the rights, I mean, independently of AI, yeah, yeah, these are the rights of the people. And then from these rights, we went to general principles, and then we said, okay, given this principle, then AI should have these seven requirements. All AI that we want to see in Europe should follow these seven requirements. Again, fairness, explainability, transparency, accountability, data, and so on. And, uh, and, uh, and Europe uh, tries really to, uh, and I think that uh, we have seen that this approach, this combined approach that Europe has uh, put forward, has been listened in some sense, for example, also by the US, because even the US in a recent uh, paper that was released by the White House about regulating AI, follows many of these ideas that came from uh, the European uh, documents. So I think that Europe has a role of uh, uh, showing uh, that it is possible to be innovative and also to be responsible okay, in delivering AI. Uh, of course, there are some uh, uh, sensibilities in Europe that are different from the US, like uh, how private data are, are used, or are, uh, who owns the private data, where they're stored, and so on. So there are some issues that are much more important for Europeans than from, uh, for people in other regions of the world. Uh, so given the, the various nuances of you know, the fact that people are different and the tradition is different, but I think the European approach is, uh, uh, if you want to use your thing, is winning in the sense of uh, being an inspiration also to other parts of the world, and for example, the US, to understand how one can be innovative and uh, ethical at the same time. So how ethics is, should not be seen as an impediment to innovation. Uh, but actually as a support to innovation. A friend of mine, a philosopher, uh, once gave me this um, analogy that says that uh, AI ethics for AI is like uh, uh, the, traffic, uh, the, tra uh, the traffic lights that we use to, when we drive. So without uh, traffic lights or without traffic uh, uh, controls or whatever uh, rules, we would not drive faster. We would drive much slower. Because we wouldn't know where cars are coming, you know, what, what, where they're going, because we, everything would be without rules. So we would drive much slower. So the fact that we have rules for everybody, the same, uh, allows us to drive faster. And that's the analogy to AI, the role of AI ethics for innovation. And I think that Europe can be an example of how this can be done. Hi, Alberto Crebiore. Uh, allow me to uh, say that uh, Kai Fu Li, in his book, uh, AI Superpower, totally disagree with you. He said that there are two, United States and China, and everybody else uh, is not there. Mm -hmm. uh, I like uh, your comment on that, but on a separate basis, uh, uh, I'm a little bit co truly confused, and I like your help. In understanding the difference between the definition of artificial intelligence, uh, what you're talking about artificial intelligence, uh, i.e., here, computing power. So that the faster the processing power, the bigger the processing power, you get uh, uh, to a better resolution, a better understanding on the x ray machine or uh, diagnostic or. Uh, fraudulent in a transaction in uh, credit card. The key for me of, uh, the, the key point for me of artificial intelligence instead is the machine being able to write uh, the algorithm. And the question is, uh, is the algorithm a different uh, level or is just uh, a larger computing power that then becomes the algorithm. So for me, AI is not computing power. 
because um, even with the machine learning approaches that definitely require very fast computers, which have a lot of computing power, uh, that's a, a need because there is the, the need of, for computing power is because you need to, elab to look at and to um, uh, elaborate um, a huge amounts of data uh, in this uh, machine learning, in, in, in the attempt to generalize from these examples you know, uh, in the supervised machine learning approach. So since you need the huge amounts of data, you need a lot of computing power just to look at, the, uh, look, look at this data and to make sense, uh, find the patterns and so on. So it's not that uh, the more power you give to a machine, the more intelligent it becomes, no. Uh, but, you, and, and not even that the more data you give, the more intelligent it becomes. You also have to be careful about what you put in, the, in those examples, what you put in, the, in that data, because if the data is very uh, unbalanced, it doesn't reflect uh, uh, all the possibilities that you find uh, in, uh, then in the real world, then the machine will learn from this unbalanced data, so we learn to make decisions that are very incorrect. Okay, so you need to be careful about what you put in this data, but since you need usually, at the, with the current state of the technology, you still need a lot of data, that's why you need the computing power to look at this data and to be able to generalize from the data. But, um, um, but I don't associate, I, I mean, I don't want to pass the message that more computing power implies more intelligence or more data even more data implies more intelligence. You need to curate the data so to make the machine uh, in being able to have the capability to solve well uh, the problem that you want the machine to solve. But again, this is the state of the art because uh, people and researchers are working hard to make the machine to have the same learning capabilities with much less data. Also because in many application domains, uh, uh, maybe you don't have so much data. So what do you do when you don't have so much data? So that's why we are trying to understand how to make machine learn well, uh, but with less, much less data. And so that means that in that case, uh, probably you won't need as much computing power because you need to analyze uh, less data. Uh, so then about Kaifuli, yes. First of all, things change very rapidly. Kai Fuli's book is, uh, I don't remember where, but I mean, some time ago, a few years ago, maybe two years or whatever, uh, and things have changed a lot. The role of Europe has been, um, Europe has invested a lot in trying to understand what's the best approach to AI, to combine innovation and responsibility. Um, and it, of course, if you just measure success in AI in a region of the world in terms of the amount of funding, Yes, Europe has less funding than the US and China. Uh, but I don't think that's the right metric to measure uh, the advancement of AI. Also because uh, my uh, feeling is that um, the ultimate goal that Europe or US or China or IBM or Microsoft, whatever, all the tech, the ultimate goal is not to improve AI. The ultimate goal is to improve ourselves through the improvement of AI. So if, if that's the measure of your success, then just improving AI for the sake of improving AI, but maybe doing things that are not acceptable according to our uh, fundamental rights, then that's not going towards the ultimate goal that I think it is. The ultimate goal of all the tech companies and all all the region in you know in, in all in all the people. So to improve ourselves, our society, our ability to solve important problems through the use of the technology. Chinese are very good uh, in using uh, facial recognition for repressing people. Well, I mean, uh, uh, um, I discovered that uh, it's very easy to judge other cultures and to say, you know that uh, you know, I don't agree with the way they, but having a lot of colleagues uh, in China, in Chinese universities and companies, or in Hong Kong, or Singapore, and so on, I have to say that uh, it's not that easy 
to make a judgment on the way technology is used. Uh, because uh, some of them, uh, they made me understand that uh, that culture um, he, uh, values um, values certain, uh, uh, I mean, it weights certain values uh, in a different way than us. So it's a culture where individual rights are less prioritary than societal cohesion, societal harmony. And this said by very, you know, uh, educated people that uh, think about a lot, they know the technology, they know how it's used in that region of the world, and so on. So when uh, you give th these uh, different ways, for us, individual rights are the most important thing. I am an individual, I have those rights, and also in Europe, not just in the US, and these rights have to be respected, period then maybe that's not the best thing for society, but it doesn't matter, but those are my rights and I want these rights to be respected. In, the, in those other regions of the world, those individual rights are important, but not as important as societal rights, societal cohesion and harmony and stability. And so everything that they do, although there are some things that are maybe not acceptable according to this as well, have to be, have to be judged with understanding the different culture. That's why I think the multicultural comparison also for AI is very important. Uh, I think that uh, okay. And then the day, you have to choose. So um, I, I don't agree that uh, you have to accept without judging um, because we are very, very old in the civility in the world. So we now we can say that there, there are uh, I, we know different systems, but uh, you have to be uh, judgmental because you can, or at least uh, it's better that you do that and understand that the facial recognition in China is used, uh, you say, for uh, um, what you say, harmony. I say for repressing and, and for, for being in the right, in, in the wrong part of history. Yeah, I didn't say that. Uh, I didn't say that uh, we don't have to judge. I'm saying that uh, uh, it's a complex. Uh, in, in judgment needs also a comp an understanding of the of that culture, and then of course one can judge whatever you want. But for example, even even without uh, bringing China, but uh, between the U.S. Uh, and uh, Europe, there are various uh, different sensitivities sensitivities about uh, uh, the way data, private data is used. Uh, Europe has a, a very uh, strict regulation like the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. So Europe thinks it's completely unacceptable the way data is used here. But, but I mean, it doesn't bring you any advancement to say, oh, as a European, it uh, is un unacceptable to use data as we use it here. Hmm. It's a different culture, different traditions, and so, we do things that in Europe would not be accepted, we meaning in the US. So we have to be uh, conscious about the different cultures and it's not that easy to say that whatever is done different from what we do, it's wrong for sure. It's a very complex cultural uh, um, base. Later, there are over there. After. We can I want to, go, want to come back to her, and thank you very much for explaining to us the difference between artificial intelligence and uh, data and computer power. I am a businessman and I am also an investor, so when uh, I start using and following artificial intelligence was just when it was the deep blue, was quite interested at the time to see how much power a computer can have and with the right mind, how they can beat the regular person. So from that, I start following companies, and today, uh, my, the way I perceive the help of artificial intelligence is the way the artificial intelligence is helping us to live a better life. And uh, I'll give you an example. One of the companies that uh, invested was in NVIDIA, that you know very well, and they are, I think, the master with one of their program that is NVIDIA Metropolis, that they very much collect billions of uh, information that uh, the artificial intelligence needs to write the program. And as you know, NVIDIA and the Telsa, they team together 
to create it, uh, what we call the future of driving. As you well know, there are five phases uh, of uh, cars, and uh, every phase zero is a car that you drive without help. Phase one is a car that they have some uh, kind of a sensor. They tell you if a person... Phase two is already a car that you can drive and they will recognize some street and some line and you can further. So I think that BMW and Telsa, they are very advanced and even now the Italian uh, company, uh, Cinquecento. But my question to you is, and that's what I am very much interested, that the big city like New York, the, the traffic is so congested, they definitely have to go sooner or later to a phase four or phase five. If we think that the, in, in the average family in the United States has two cars and they spend $20,000 to maintain the cars and the 95% of the time this car, they are parked, this is a real waste over there. So I think that going to phase four and they invested a lot, so this is cloud involved, information involved, tells involved, and they would like to know for my investment how far away we are. You know, some people, they think that it will be there in five years. Some people, they think they will be there in 10 years. Can you give me your opinion, please? I cannot give you a number. First, because I don't work on self-driving cars. I work in AI for other applications because IBM is less into that business. But, uh, uh, but I think that uh, you need a lot of, as, as we said before, you know, uh, self-driving cars are still a bit uh, brittle. Uh, and not robust enough, but of course uh, uh, you need robustness, um, especially in a, in a scenario where you have uh, self-driving cars together with cars uh, driven by human beings. If there were only self-driving cars, it would be much easier for the self-driving cars to be robust and to do the right thing. Uh, so uh, there are some, uh, uh, I don't know if complete cities, but there are some uh, settings where uh, they are making experiments. Uh, one, I think, is in Texas, and one even in Japan, where uh, there are, for example, in Japan, there is a, a senior community, um, kind of a small uh, city and you know, environment, where there are only self-driving cars, and uh, the senior people can go one place to, from one place to another one only with self-driving cars. And uh, so they are experimenting what it means. But of course, in a big city or even in a small city, where there are a lot of people driving their own car, uh, it's not easy, the transition. Uh, how do you get to, you cannot just tell people, okay, from tomorrow or the whole of New York, you only have self-driving cars. Uh, so you have, to, you have to understand how to deal with the transition, and the transition makes it more difficult for the self-driving cars because they need to co, uh, you know, to co exist together with the uh, human-driven cars. Um, but definitely self-driving cars, as you said, will help because if we have self-driving cars, then in this senior member community, nobody owns a car. The cars are there for everybody to use when it's needed and then to be used by somebody else when they're not needed. But of course, the tradition and the culture of having your own car, of choosing your own car and the shape that you like, the engine that you like, the brand that you like, it will take time to, to change. You know? Because for some people, a car is uh, a symbol of something and it's uh, part of your identity. So it, it will change with time. More question? Yeah. Good evening. Um, I'm in the educational field, so I have a very specific question. What's the impact of AI on education? Will we have uh, robot teachers in the next future? Or? Well, AI has um, um, a lot of relationship with education. First, in uh, helping teachers understand how to, how to um, teach in ways that may be different from different uh, attitude of the different uh, kids or students. Uh, so personalized teaching can be supported by uh, AI that can uh, recognize that different students have different attitudes and different things that could be done with them to make them learn 
in, in the best way for each individual student. So personal, personalization of the educational activities. Um, and also, of course, uh, it has to do with education also in the other direction, meaning that uh, we need to educate people to what this technology is. Uh, independently of what this, as we said before, you know, we need to train people uh, in whatever job they are doing to work with this technology. So there is a need of a lot of educational uh, activities uh, to make everybody understand where the technology is because we know that uh, uh, otherwise people just read the very extreme views of AI, like uh, AI is already solved and can, and can uh, solve all our problems right now today, which of course is not true, or AI is, uh, uh, the, 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 I mean, is, uh, robots people. are going to wake up and, uh, and they're going to kill us all tomorrow morning. So all these very extreme view, they make very, uh, attractive titles, uh, uh, but they are not realistic. So there is a lot of need to educate the general public, but also every professional, but also the policy makers to understand where the technology is. Because if they don't understand where the technology is right now, they may tend to regulate in ways that kills innovation or that is too liberal uh, and allows things that we don't want to happen. Maybe there is one last question over there. Here, okay. My name is Maureen Klein. Um, I was wondering if you have any examples from the program with the SDGs, like uh, how AI can be used to towards eliminating poverty or any of the sustainable development goals. Well, there are a lot of uh, a lot of different projects, uh, like. Um, uh, let me see, some few uh, very simple examples are uh, AI to collect data to, uh, to um, try to resolve the opioid crisis, or uh, I remember a project about uh, uh, the uh, Zika virus. Uh, trying to you know understand improve the understanding and solve that or AI that was taking uh, satellite images uh, to help farmers in Africa to understand given the scarcity of uh, water to understand where to put water in a very precise way um, or um, uh, and so the man, many, many different projects, but uh, many of the projects are in empowering through this technology, empowering really people that otherwise would not have access. Uh, because AI, yeah, it, it really, uh, compared to other technologies, it, it is in some sense very, um, it can be used by many, many people. It does require a lot of resources. Once you have an algorithm that can understand images and has been trained by somebody, then you can deliver it to the farmer or to anybody else that even doesn't have man, ma, many resources and it can be used in their specific things. Or, for example, I remember uh, um, in Japan, a farmer that was using AI to recognize uh, uh, in a better way, in a more correct way, which uh, he was, he was, uh, he had a farmer of cucumbers, he was which cucumbers were ripe enough uh, to be picked up or not. So, you know, whatever the activities these people have, uh, you can use the technology to help them scale their activities uh, that otherwise, and to make them more successful that otherwise without the technology we, they would not be able to scale or they would be. So empowering people that do not have resources and that achie not achieves but I mean is goes towards the achievement of many of these sustainable development goals. Very last question over there. Sorry, hi. <coughs> um, I just saw an exhibition um, last week at a gallery in Chelsea uh, by um, but a young Colombian artist, and he took a GPT-2 uh, AI, which is, I understand, one of the latest uh, Google, yeah. you know, released. And, it's, um, and it was censored before, and now they release a new version, you know, which is more, like, consumer-friendly, because the other one had, like, too much power, I understood. But, but anyway, but his project was, uh, he took all the different cosmogonies of the world, uh, different religions, beliefs about God, about the, the universe, all that, 
and the AI has been pretty much writing its own Bible, which is saying the way every day about the idea of God and the universe and all that. So taking from the, from the ancient indigenous to the ancient Egyptians to the Western. So uh, talking about the decolonization of uh, AI, you know, that we, like we try to control everything, that our version is the only right one, could be an AI-driven uh, religion in the future. And uh, that I don't know. I don't know, but uh, um, uh, I don't know. I mean, it, uh, we didn't talk with the Vatican about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, but but the GDP, GP2, uh, GPT two. I want to tell well, what is everybody. It, by else. the way, yeah, exactly. I think that so nobody knows what, what it is. is about. So it's um, it's. Um, it's a, a, a system that uh, allows you, everybody can try on a, web, on a website, uh, it, uh, a language in, in, uh, very capable of completing um, a piece of text that we write. So we write, you can write a piece of text like, I don't know, uh, microphones are very, hmm? and he's going to continue that text in a way that sometimes, not most of the times, but sometimes is very appropriate. So as if, as if he understood what, what we wanted to talk about, and he continues on the same topic with not necessarily one few words, but even entire paragraphs, you know. So he has, he has learned from a large database of um, a text to uh, extract from the piece of text that we write the entities and the topic and what we, we think that we wanted to talk about. And he continues that piece of text with uh, te some additional text. And sometimes it's very appropriate. But most of the times, I have to say, it's not, which is very sh shocking because uh, the amount of data and energy and computing power that he used to train this system is amazing. Okay, so meaning that uh, uh, that usually taken as an example that uh, that kind the kind of techniques that we have right now for uh, uh, learning from huge amounts of data with huge computing power has some limit because even if uh, uh, if Google that has all the resources that he wants all the data that he wants and all the computing power that he wants cannot do something that makes sense most of the time in this very simple task, then, then, uh, it, then it yeah. means that uh, there is some limitation in the approach as well. Yeah, that reminds me of a new book just out here in America. Unfortunately, I don't remember now the name. And uh, the author, a woman, uh, wrote that uh, the problem is not that mach machines are too intelligent, too smart, but that they are still not really smart. And she gave an example like uh, saying that with artificial intelligence, uh, a machine cannot uh, write uh, itself uh, a coherent recipe for a cake. And so she said, uh, it, it's not probable that, that it will take over our world, right? Yeah, but, but, but the machines will become smarter when they, we, we will understand how to embed this common sense reasoning. Without common sense reasoning to understand, to have a model of the world, it's difficult to be smart for machines, for human beings, for everybody. So that, that's why for now you see very smart, but in very narrow and closed world domain. And you don't see these uh, general intelligence capabilities. So thank you so much, Francesca, for thank this uh, very interesting conversation.